Welcome, Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel is a software engineer with over 15 years experience, a technologist and an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, in today's talk, he's going to talk about uh, the Ignite deployment at BMP, uh, mm -hmm. a 600 CPU Ignite deployment uh, that's being used for hybrid transactional processing. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you. So today I'm going to be talking about how we used Apache Ignite at BNP Paribas to build a hybrid data analytics solution. Um, quickly about myself. So like you said, I'm a software engineer and I've been doing that job for about 15 years now. Past five years I've been working in London, mainly in the finance industry in those two companies, Revolut, which is a, like a FinTech company, and BNP Paribas, which is a French bank, the largest European bank in terms of total of assets. And I've been working for the corporate and investment banking arm of that bank. Um, the problem we are trying to solve with Apache Ignite is the following. Uh, it's many slides for one big problem that we are facing in the bank. This problem is one of scattering of data and scattering of where the analysis for this data reside. And one concept we have is the concept of single source of truth. It's something that's really hard to achieve in the bank because data is basically scattered across the bank inside small silos. And the same data can have many shapes, many forms, and it's the base on which uh, the many divisions of the bank are going to be working on. So we have the trading teams and the sale people they are going to want to collaborate and work over those data sets. But those data sets are, like I said, scattered and sometimes even impossible to reconcile. So no single source of truth. And the other, other things we face is that the tools that are used to analyze this, this data is uh, scattered as well. So we have a multitude of tools and sometimes even the, the traders, the sales people have their own Python scripts that they have on their desk. They have their own Excel spreadsheets and it's hard to maintain. It's hard to, for it to live their life. And it's very, very costly as well to maintain. We have as well, always, as well, sorry, IT teams who build their own softwares to visualize the data. And it's all a big, um, I mean, everything is not centralized and we're really missing that, that uh, dimension here. So the data on one side is scattered and the way we analyze it is as well uh, scattered. And what we really need here, and in particular in, in the context of a investment bank, is a way, like I said, to centralize the data. And we are, we are talking about a lot of data sources. It can range from real-time data sets to APIs, to huge analytical databases. And we want to bring all this together somewhere in the center. And we want also to do something very interesting is achieve uh, what I call, what is called real-time situational awareness. So we want to be able to have those analytics on all those data sets, which are both very static and very volatile, like, like market data. And we want maybe to execute those analysis in reaction to, to real-time data. And so that's why we, we are calling for a hybrid real-time and OLAP analytics system that sits somewhere between OLTP. So we're not really doing transaction in our system, but we deal with real-time data, which is more of the OLTP domain and OLAP systems which are really like, you know, more static and structured databases. Um, I'm going to explain what you're trying to achieve with those, it's like a simplified uh, functional code, but this is what we're going to want to do basically. So let's say I'm a trader and I want to run some analysis on, my, on the assets I manage, for instance. And on the input of this pipeline, I will have a list of assets. It can be stocks, it can be other type of assets, it doesn't matter. And for each of these assets, the first thing I'm going to want to do is to, I want to enrich it with data from all those data sources in the bank. When that's, I'm going to go over all those stages in detail so you get a better understanding of what we do, but I'm going to go through it one, one time fast. So when we have the data that is loaded, we want to check if I'm authorized to see this data. Can I access that client or can I see assets from that country? Things like that. And when this is done, I will be able, able sorry, to apply some computations to that data. And it can be scripts, it can be algorithms that help me trade on an everyday basis. And it can often, it's very complex analysis we do with the data. And then we want to restrict our, our data set. So we want to filter it down. B 
before we reduce it and we format it to the shape that I'm going to be using as a user. So the first stage we have is the load data stage. And here we want to load data from all the data sources that we need to perform our computation. So let's say I have a stock like Apple stock and I want like real-time market data for it. And then I want to load 10 years of history of what happened with that stock in the bank. And I want to load all the users, all the clients I've been selling that, that stocks to over the past five years. So you see, I'm, I'm here for that particular stock. I'm going to load data from like hybrid data sources. Market data can be very static and voluminous data sources, very structured, but then we have other sort of structure like time series data sources. We have like document oriented databases and they're all coming together in that stage. Uh, right now we are, we are dealing with almost uh, 100 data sources and this number is growing. Um, and the size of data sources is ranging from like megabyte, gigabyte to terabyte scale, which is the upper limit, the real upper limit of our architecture. And then when the data has been loaded from all the data sources, we want to authorize it based on what the user can, can see and his access policy. And here as well, it's quite complex because the policy has, are really specialized per user and they tend also to evolve over time and it's out of our control, of course. So it can restrict access to an entire data source. So can I access like market data information? It will restrict the access to given rows of data source. So can I see that particular client or even fields of other data sources. Like, can I access the email of my client? This is what this authorization uh, stage will apply to our data. And then computation. This is where the heavy lifting happens and it's something that is very CPU intensive and quite complex. And the idea behind, behind this is that users are going to be able to put their own scripts inside the system and run them directly on the data they extracted. And so, it's not, this also is a moving part because this computation script that depend on one another. We can imagine a user who is going to write like a function, which is going to be used by another one. So as you've understood, nothing is stable in that system. The data moves, authorization moves, and also the computation scripts are not stable. Then when we're done, like I said, we're going to filter the data down to what we really want. So it can be simple things like, I just want data for the technology sector or for US region, but then I want maybe to filter data on like a computational result, like above 50% or true instead of, instead of false, stuff like that. And when we're done with filtering, we only have the data that we want. We have a stream of data that comes in some reducers. And here we are able to perform some aggregation of the data and we want to condense the data to extract its value in a very, very uh, condensed way. And people will want to do some grouping. So let me see the data by country. Let me see the data by client. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then we give it its final shape, like I said. And this can be a chart. This can be a dashboard with many charts. It can be a grid for an Excel export, pivot table, or others. And here, for us, the challenge is to be able to run this pipeline uh, with the lowest possible latency as quickly as possible. As you've understood, caching computation results here is it's impossible because everything is moving. Data is moving access policies are moving and the algorithms we apply are moving. So each time someone wants to load some representation of his data, we need to recompute it. There's no way to cache sim simply. And of course we need uh, the system to be able to scale out in terms of memory because we want to accommodate more and more data sources that come into our system. And also the CPU because <laughs> the more successful our system is, the more complex people will want to interact with it. And uh, the computation stage tends to be more and more CPU intensive on the one hand. And on the other hand, if you have more users, of course, you want to run this pipeline in parallel uh, more and more. So what we did to implement this, and of course we use, we use Apache Ignite, it's not a surprise. Um, Apache Ignite for us brings all the properties that I've asked for before. So first, uh, it's in-memory computing architecture brings the ability to do some very complex and very high speed computing on hybrid data sets. It's scalable uh, horizontally in terms of CPUs and memories. And it enables us to store the data into a single source of truth in the middle of the bank. 
I want to talk about that uh, quickly as well because it's, it's an interesting concept for me. Uh, and so we decided in the project to try to move uh, from the paradigm, I don't know how to pronounce that word, <laughs> from the, the way of loading data from ETL, where you extract the data first, then you transform it in, in a complex staging area, and then you have some delay that is that is uh, introduced, and then you load it to Ignite. And we're trying to move it uh, as much as possible toward the ELT way of, of loading data, where first you extract, then you directly load into Ignite. And then with our pipeline capability and so our computing capability and reducing capabilities, you are able to enforce all those transformations while they perform the computations. So they can even do joins on the fly, and we don't need to denormalize any schema when we load the data, for instance. And so our pattern is a bit uh, like a mix of both with a small transform stage. We're going to map or format, for instance, some dates or some strings, very small and localized transformation. And we're going to rely on the uh, in-memory computing platform to shift uh, the transform stage into the computing uh, process of, of our of our tool. So with, with this tool, we use all the following APIs. I'm going to go over a few and giving you a few of the hints and the things we did with, with each of them. Uh, so distributed SQL queries, uh, computing API, which is the, the war horse of our, of our system, and uh, all those are as well. But before I'm going to to talk about the APIs, I just want to mention that uh, the way that we define affinity keys is central to our, our, our solution. And I'm going to, to, to show now a bit more of, a Ignite, uh, of the Ignite domain. And I talked about data sources, and now they're going to translate into Ignite cache. So we can imagine that one data source is a cache into Ignite to simplify. And so what we have in our domain, it's very good for affinity keys, is that Usually, our data source, they give information about a given class of assets. So they can give information about stocks, about bonds, about other others. And it's good because this enables us to introduce this asset ID, asset name, as an affinity key. Very often, though, um, the data sources will have more than one dimension, more than one primary key. It won't be only the asset, so you can have asset for a date, so history of uh, data for a stock, for instance, or asset for a date and for a trading portfolio. So in my portfolio, at a given date, what metrics do I have for that stock? So we can have like two, three, even more dimensions to those caches. But using affinity key as like asset ID has been a very good uh, ID for us. And so if you look at, uh, at uh, sorry, a 10, so those are master nodes in, in the Ignite cluster, we have 10. Which, which is good about that. Let's say we have 60 caches, or those are caches, distributed caches, caches, caches sorry, around the cluster. Each node is going to take care of its own subset of assets. So if you have 10,000 assets, 10,000 stocks, each node will know about subset, one tenth approximately of the, of the stocks. This in enables us, of course, to scale easily. Um, of course, we have some times where this is not the case and I'm just putting some not random figures, but approximate figures to get so you understand it. But the idea is that sometimes, because we have many dimensions to those caches, to those data sources, we have cases where this repartition, where, where this uh, balancing is really uneven. And in that case, uh, it's going to load uh, some nodes of the cluster more than others, and it's going to slow down every computation because, of course, the computation runs at the speed of the, of the slowest, slowest node. So we end up with, case, with cases like that when one node is going to hold like this asset, which is present in like six books. So here I have two dimensions, like the book and the asset. And this asset is in almost every book, as the other one are in one book. And we end up with a repartition uh, balancing like that, where one node holds way more data than the others. Very simply, uh, very simple to sort it out. So that's uh, the easy part of the solution, but we just need to have some metadata about the data sources that are not balanced. And we can introduce another dimension into the, the affinity key to rebalance the data evenly. But of course, if we do that, we hit a first problem is that we don't want to do network calls all the time. We want to do some collocated computing. And here we use the near cache uh, of Apache Ignite to do that. And for that, if we want, for instance, to compute data which is going to mix 
this trading book cache, we call it like that, and so market data cache, you understand that on each node will know about asset 234, 234, but this asset one will be spread across all nodes of our cluster. And then it will be hosted on one particular node. This node, master node two, for instance, will, oh, sorry, will hold asset one. And then we want to do the computation. We just need to load asset one once into our near cache to reuse it. And this master node two will just have to broadcast all those assets to all the nodes of the cluster. But what's good about that is that those particular red assets are a very low proportion compared to the gray ones. And so those broadcasts will happen a few times compared to the number of assets and it will not slow down uh, the computation. Um, and with Affinikis, of course, we are able to leverage the collocated joins. And we can do queries like that, which are very good for us. We're able to join on all our caches on the asset ID, which, which is the affinity key, and filter down the data. And that means for us that this pipeline, is, is we can rewrite it and say, OK, I, I want to move this thing and transform, uh, after some introspection of the, the policy, it into some SQL filters. And this, some part of it as well, can be transformed into SQL filters so we can reduce the stream of data coming into the pipeline at the source. and improve drastically our computation uh, speed. This is the picture of one Ignite node, master node, and uh, one of the nodes that we deployed. It's going to run that pipeline locally. So first, it's going to execute that load stage where we use the SQL collocated joins to retrieve as few data as we can here to match the scope. And then because we want, of course, to exploit the computing power of this node, we're going to run into a pool of thread and each thread is going to get a, a chunk, a partition of the of the keys, of the stocks. We can say it's stocks to compute. So this one will will compute the, for the Apple stock, for instance. It's going to read all the data from uh, from the caches from Ignite locally again for that stock. So market data, trading data, client data. It's going to compute, apply those scripts I mentioned, then filter it down more because, like I said, some filter apply only to computing results and then reduce it. Every thread will do that, will be combined into a partial aggregate, which will be sent back to the Ignite client. This is an Ignite client node, which exposes a REST API. In that API, come in the computation request. And so we use uh, Ignite compute API, so we broadcast the compute job across the nodes. Each node will deal with its own subset of, of assets and give up a partial aggregation for this subset. So for instance, this arrow corresponds to the first thousand uh, stocks, for instance. In the end, our, our, um, our client will recombine all the data together to reach the final result and format based on what the user wants. So like I said, build a chart with it, build an Excel export and stuff like that to give back the computation result. Uh, Something very interesting that we did to optimize the performances of our computation is use the binary mode of Apache Ignite caches. Because what we notice is that most of our data sources are wide data sources. We have huge SQL tables with hundreds of columns. And more often than not, people will want to draw a chart with only two lines, for instance, for, for that uh, particular table. And so we noticed that, of course, uh, using binary object reduces the, the resources that we need to deserialize the data. But when you do that, there is a trade-off between the flexibility of the schema and the deserialization performances. Um, so what we did is we noticed on, on the first hand that most of the time, the big data sources tend to be very more static than the small one. And the big one are also more uh, structured than the small one. So we can we can make a choice between those two implementation of like, like I call the cache payload. So all those, those two methods, this one is based on the map, the Java map, which means that each time we do a cache read from Ignite, uh, we're going to deserialize the whole object uh, from Ignite binary format to a Java object. This has a cost, of course. And when we use that implementation, we're going to have a binary object in that thing. And when we do a get on the binary objects, we're going to deserialize only the field that we want to, to access. 
This one has the advantage of flexibility because in the map we can put whatever we want in each document of the, of the in each document of the cache. We can change the keys; it doesn't matter. Here, um, if you start uh, changing the schema, then the heap memory of your of your node will, will get bloated with all the uh, convert the different different schema that exist. And that's why when we load the data in the in the cache, we use like a schema first approach, and we need to define a schema whose order will not change unless if you want to add some new fields, so you add them at the end. And a schema is basically a map, an order map, with the name of your field and the type of your object, the one that you're going to put in your in your cache. And when you build your binary object to put them in the cache, you need to go through the schema to enforce the order and the type of all the field. And, you go through the data from the schema, not the other way around. So you ensure that, that your schema doesn't move. And even if you are missing some data for a given field, you can set it to null in the binary object, but you still enforce the right type. So a very small number of schema exist. And you have this, this way still of being a bit flexible because you can build your schema by introspecting your data or doing queries to your, your SQL uh, database if it's a SQL database. Um, I'm going to give you a short overview of our production deployment as well. Uh, this is our, our uh, cluster provisioning. So in, in total, we deployed 32 master nodes uh, and we deployed three client nodes that are going to perform some feeding and uh, computing tasks. Uh, we have a total of six uh, hypervisors and each of them has 1.5 terabyte of RAM and 110 cores. And you have a huge amount of storage. I don't even know the number, but I know it's significantly, big, significantly bigger than this. Sorry. Um, these are all the things we use to have a stable setup of our of our cluster. So it's deployed on two data centers in the bank. So we use a, a private cloud for that, and in that cloud uh, we use Kubernetes to manage our Ignite nodes. Um, we use, uh, of course, those tools to manage the logs, so Kibana and Elasticsearch. And we use Prometheus and, and Grafana as well to be able to have some metrics out of the nodes. Uh, we use FileBit to push uh, our logs into Elasticsearch. And uh, we use Jenkins to uh, deploy, to run some, some tests. I'm going to go a bit into more details about that. Publish Docker image inside the Artifactory. Uh, that will get pulled by the pod themselves. And for more precise metrics, we're going to use uh, this one, which is of a great help, Java Mission Control. Um, so the persistence. So for us, we use, uh, like the talk before, we, we have zero replication factor for our caches. And we entirely rely on Ceph technology, which is going to give us a robust replicated file system. So we use Ceph file system is going to replicate all our data across the whole, uh, across every data center that we use. And um, independently of where a node is getting uh, uh, bootstrapped by Kubernetes, we're going to set the um, Ignite home variable to point to a persistent volume that will be mapped directly to self storage. So that whatever happens, if a hypervisor goes down or a data center goes down, Kubernetes will just uh, redeploy our node on other available uh, machines, and we'll be able to repoint to remap our data directly to the, the replicated directory to get our data back. And we noticed that most of the time, with a, a Kubernetes restart policy to automatic, when a node, a, a, an Ignite node comes down, it will automatically come back up. Uh, we'll be ha we'll have a, a very short downtime for that, and it's, it's enough. Uh, in more serious cases, when we have some, losing a data center or then something serious happening in the application, we often lose more than one node. And then the replication factor of one is not very useful in our case. So we really went for zero to optimize the number, the memory available to store our data and rely entirely on, on Ceph for the persistence of our, of our data. Uh, yeah, the observability of the system is very important. Uh, it was said before, but if you if you run uh, Ignite with many nodes and you cannot know what's going on, you really are blind and you don't know you don't know what you're doing basically. And so we use um, Log4j, and we use it with this uh, feature, which 
enable us to inject some equivalent of a distributed trace ID in all our logs. That means that each time there is a computing task that goes into our pipeline, we're going to tag every log that goes along with that task with a unique ID. And then we can, with Kibana, have a cross uh, node view of where the computation went, what happened on each node, etc. How time, how much time did it take? Did, did, was there an exception or something? And with Grafana, we built a dashboard uh, with lots of, of uh, system metrics. And then we can easily know if a node is completely out there, if there are some memory consumption issues. And it's very efficient, those two together combined to track uh, what's going on on the cluster. Uh, we also uh, insisted a lot on the smoke test. So we basically uh, set up a fire alarm. And every minute it's going to run a full pipeline which includes making call to other services on which the computation relies. So I didn't talk about them at all, but it's going to basically test the whole system and launch a complete computation on a static cache that we created and be able to check the output against the expected result. And we run it every minute. And if that computation doesn't give exactly the up, uh, aggregation that we're waiting for, it means that the system has a problem and we get a push notification. Um, yeah, we use the Ignite REST API a little bit to access topology information and, of course, uh, uh, cache uh, statistic. And we use uh, like this tool to query the caches themselves uh, through JDBC, and, and we can see what's in the cache. Very important as well to see what data you have, what's going on on the data side. Uh, one very, very important tool that we use is Java Mission Control. So we use Java 13 with Apache Ignite. So it has very good performances with Java Flight Recorder as well. It's very good to connect to nodes and get a picture of what's going on in the JVM to optimize our code. And it has proven a, of ex, a extreme help, those two, two together. Uh, now I want to talk about the limitation that we hit, not all of them, but a few of them. Um, so like I said, <laughs> we are a bit victims of the scalability of the system because the more we are efficient with Apache Ignite, the more data sources want to come in our system and the more users want to come as well. And we come across uh, new use cases. And some use cases are going to come out of this hybrid space and move towards the OLAP space more. And when you come up upon pure OLAP use cases where, where the data set is getting extremely big, we reach some uh, performance issue and we are unable to manage th those uh, loads. Right now, the upper limit that we have is, is generating a, a grid, let's say, is about 100 million rows, and that's the top thing we can do with that current architecture. It's not designed for such OLAP uh, cases. Uh, yeah, and then when we hit some uh, data schema that is, I would say, snowflake schema, it's hard to adapt this affinity uh, model to such schema when the attribute tables around the central table of the schema are, are large as well. It's very hard to apply collocated uh, distributed joins, and, and the performance are really dropping in, in such use cases. Um, and thank you very much for listening <laughs> to my presentation. Uh, I went very fast across everything because 30 minutes is very short, and Apache Ignite has really I mean, helped us in a lot of ways. But the ecosystem is so complex that, that covering everything in detail is a bit difficult. So if you have any questions or don't hesitate, I'll be happy to answer you. OK, thank you, Emmanuel. Thanks for your talk. Thanks for your time today. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, sure. that I will send you away. Uh, just give me one second. Let me just check and see if there are any more I should gather. <clears throat> All right. so. Uh, the first question, the pipeline that you showed towards mm -hmm. the beginning, uh, you mentioned uh, there was a section for authorization, and you mentioned that mm -hmm. even the authorization policies were uh, shifted. Yeah. How did you end up solving that problem? Have you built uh, something around Ignite that pulls those authorization policies in place, or are you reaching out to existing systems in the bank that control those? Yeah, so reach out to existing system that, that manage those policies and we're able to analyze them, like I said, to transform them into SQL filter, basically. 
Right. But those policies are managed in a specialized system that is central to the bank. And right. that lives its own life, basically. <laughs> okay. And so that was the thing that you said you couldn't cash because they're managed externally, right? Exactly. And it's it's very um, uh, fine it's per user. Every user has its own uh, set of policies. And you can also cash the, the computation for one user and reuse it for another one because it's always going to be different. Yeah. Okay. So has that had an impact on the uh, performance that you, you've gotten out of Ignite? It actually helps the performance because it adds some ex extra filter to the top part of the pipeline. So we are able to filter it down to less, uh, I would say, assets that, we, that go through the pipeline. Right. But also it, removed the, it further removed the possibility to cache some, some computations that are very heavy. So it's a bit of a trade-off there. Gotcha. OK. Um, I, in your uh, earlier slides as well, you showed a, a code snippet of how you were calculating the affinity keys. Mm -hmm. uh, in that calculation, I, I recall seeing something about the occurrence of an asset. Mm -hmm. So the question on that is, does that have uh, an impact, for example, if the number of occurrences change over time, um, does that have an impact on, like, what happens to your data in the cluster? Are you able to map it to the correct nodes because the calculation would effectively change? So basically, uh, what we what you observe is that a, a very small number of, of assets are going to go above that threshold and the one that do will stay above and the one that don't will stay below. And this is quite stable basically. And, and we don't change that, uh, it, it won't change the um, way that the data is balanced right. over, over time. Gotcha. Okay, um, and then later there was a, a slide uh, mm -hmm. about the how you how you map all of the data and store it in Ceph, so you don't use any replication in Ignite itself. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the way that's done, um, what happens, uh, for example, if you have a, a Kubernetes a, a, an Ignite node that goes down, Kubernetes restarts it on a pod where uh, the data isn't available yet, do you get any noticeable performance implications of that setup? Um, usually the data, I mean, we have a very few physical machines in our setup. We have six uh, physical machines. Right. And the data is available on all those machines because uh, the Ceph cluster basically is shared between all those six machines and replicated on those machines themselves. So oh. when, when, when a pod goes up after going down, the data is always almost here. When it's not, we see some performances issues and we can see directly in, uh, in Grafana where when we see the, the node is having trouble to rejoin the cluster and stays okay. completely out of, uh, it becomes a crazy node. <laughs> we need to wait for right. it to be able to join correctly the cluster. Okay, so does that have an impact on your uh, startup times then? Uh, if all the, the, the data is there on, on Ceph, when that node is coming back up, is that what you mean by craziness? It's taking a long time because of the amount yes. of data? Exactly, yeah, 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 exactly. Right, right, okay. Um, so that was it for, for questions that Thank I you. had. Um, do you have any last words, any, uh, I guess, lessons or advice uh, that you found useful in, in your time using Ignite that you would like to you know, pass on to the community before you finish? Yeah, so just I want to thank you, to thank the community for, for all their work and using the Q&A forum of Ignite community is really helpful. People are really responsive and can help you. Uh, they are ready to help you and they do it very quickly. It's a very, very efficient responses. So thank you very much for that. And yeah, Ignite uh, has a big learning curve, but when you get on top of it, you really get amazing results out of it. So. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you.